This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Hover. Finding the perfect domain name is incredibly easy with Hover. Go to Hover.com and use the promo code KNOWHOW at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase. Today on Know How, if you want to build this, you first got to build this. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Balazer, and joining me today is not Brian Burnett, the cranky hippo. It's this guy. Hi, I'm Patrick Delahanty. Yeah. Now, uh, of <laughs> course, uh, Brian right now is traveling throughout the world. He's looking for the secret to life and the universe and everything. So we asked our resident geek, Patrick Delahanty, to drop in and, and give us a hand with a few of our know-how projects. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be on know-how. Yeah, well, you know, I figured we're going for the less raggedy look here, so we need someone who is a raggedy. specialist in, in you know, the raggedy <laughs> doctor. Yeah, yes. I got it. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, now, we kind of miss the brick house. I mean, I, I, I love yeah. the new place. The new place is far more efficient. It's far more productive. The workflow is great. But there was a charm. Yeah, right? we had fond memories there. We did. And, and, it, and it had its little quirks. It did, but it also <laughs> had uh, those wonderful Stargates. Remember the things in oh, the production alley? I remember when I had seen the video of it being built. Was, oh, my God, that looks like a Stargate. And then they lit up, and it was, it was so cool. Kind of we just needed the, the, uh, the, the pool of water. It uh, needed the chevrons to lock in. Yeah. Yeah, that, we didn't we have that, do that without we disintegrating have, in the studio. But yeah, yeah, it did have the arches and it the lights. It did, it did. Cool. So when we moved over, over here, I got put into the, uh, the producer's bullpen. And uh, you know, I thought it would be nice to have a little bit of that. So yeah. I, I asked him, I said, if we've got any extra trellis, if we've got any of this extra food grade tube, this, this is actually used Wait, by factories that make food. Food flows through here. It Food flows so through like here. So like at McDonald's, this is where the... That's how the, the burgers meat. get to your bun. They just plop it uh, down. It's, okay. boom, <laughs> it's like air delivered. Oh, but I, I said, hey, if you've got some, save it for me. We'll put it into the producer's bullpen, and I'll turn it into a little something-something. So the little something-something was, of course, yeah. had to do lights. We, do, we love lights here on Know How. Yeah, and they can't see it, but this is like 200 feet tall. It, it actually is really, really... <laughs> it goes all the way from the floor. It's probably what? Uh, down through the floor, this into is, the bedrock. This is like a, Eight foot? Well, no. It's uh, yeah, maybe a ten yeah. foot. It might be a ten foot. Like eight, I think. Something like that. Yeah. From it's six, six, it's so. a it's a lighting trellis. Is that? But then we put this uh, the food grade tube, and this is what we used inside the old studio to make the stargates. And of course, inside of here is just a string of SMD fifty fifties, really bright RGB LEDs. Not the 2812s that we like to play with, just because I wanted bright and cheap over dimmer and more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and and it lights this up really well. And you've just got one strip in here. That's that's just one strip. I mean, it kind of reflects it. It looks like multiple. Right. Well, what I did was I basically took one of these strips, these waterproof strips, mm -hmm. and folded it back upon itself. So oh. the, I took off the adhesive and I made so there's a light on each side. I see. Uh, yeah, oh. and, and but the tube, the tube does the hard part. It actually diffuses the light because what you don't want is you don't want people to see the individual lights. You want them to see sort of the light right. in general. Yeah, yeah, but. Folks, this is not actually the project. I mean, this is fun. I really like this thing. This, this does bring back memories of the old brick house. Uh, but instead, we wanted to show people the way that we control something like this. Ah, you've got control here. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Because we have done, as I mentioned, a lot of the raggedy, where we yeah. show them how to wire up an Arduino. We take something like this, and we, uh, we give them all the little connections that they have to make. We give them the code, and that's fun. But I got tired of doing one-off type things where you double side tape this thing inside of the enclosure <laughs> like we did for the Aquavays. Instead, I thought, what if, what if we gave our audience a way to make a modular project box, something that will work oh. for lighting up a Stargate tube or for, you know, lo lo controlling your latest string of WS2812s or even doing the Step Duino programs. What if oh. we made it so modular that they could design their own control panel for whatever switches and knobs they wanted and their own tray so that they could put the Arduino and then whatever support equipment it needed to complete the project. Yeah, that sounds great because there's so many more options and you don't have to reconstruct it every time. Precisely, and that's what we were going for. Uh, I do like making 3D projects, but I understand some people out there 
may want to make, say, a single tray or a single control panel and then swap in and out the modules so that they can go from one project to the next. Unfortunately, a lot of our audience doesn't have an unlimited budget where they could just have a big rack full of parts. You do tend to kind of cannibalize older projects to make newer yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and show you how to make Project Nanobox. Uh, quite simply, this is a way to get a Arduino Nano, so one of these smaller ones with the Atmega 328 chipset, inside a project box that can be customized to your heart's desire. What do you think? Did yeah, it, th this, good start. this, this, is, this sounds great. Okay, good. So let's get kick it off by looking at some of the parts that we're going to need for the nano box. The first thing that we're going to want is LEDs. Now, again, this is going to change depending on what you want to do with it. But if you wanted to make something like what we've got here with our, our little Stargate reminiscent thing from the brick house, you need some of these. And I actually found a really good source. Kara, if you go to that link, it's bang good. These are 5050s. Remember, five meters of 5050 SMD RGB 300. That's 300 LEDs on this strip that goes five meters. And what you want is you want the waterproof version because it's just a tiny bit more expensive than the non-waterproof. And by tiny bit, I mean like a dollar more expensive. Uh, it's, it's actually really easy to strip off the waterproofing if you do need to snip and solder in. Uh, and this is just about the right height if you want to double it over on yourself to go about yeah. eight, nine feet. And if it's waterproof and you put it in a food tube and food goes through there, it's still okay. Set. It's yeah. still okay. <laughs> Although I don't think the, the vinyl on this is food rated. Uh, so your burger might taste just, like vinyl. Just water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, now, again, because this is a modular project, you don't have to buy these. You could buy any LEDs, or this doesn't even need to be an LED project. But if you want to follow along with what we're doing, this is what you're going to want to get. The second thing that you need to get is the LED strip driver module. And again, this is only if you're doing the 50-50s. We've played with this a bit. And uh, Kara, if you go to that link, this is what it looks like. It's, it's going to cost you about $5. You can get it less expensive in bulk. I actually bought 10 of these for about $3 each. Uh, but that's just because, again, I know I'm going to be doing a lot of projects with these RGB LEDs. Uh, if, you, if you look at those pictures, what I like about this is it's really, really simple to install. It's got those screw-down terminals on the one side, the one with the double terminal. That's for power. That's 12 volts in. And on the other side, that goes out to the LED strip. This board is fantastic because it's been silk screened. It's got all of the instructions on it. It tells you what's positive, what's green, red, and blue. Uh, so there, there's no guessing. You can also daisy chain these. If you want to control multiple strips with the same Arduino, uh, it, go to the, the, the top picture, Kara, the, no, of that. If you, yeah, the top picture. There you go. The top picture? The top picture. There you go. See, that one. You'll notice there's an in and an out. So you can take the input from the Arduino and then pass it on to as many of these as you want if you want to, say, light up an entire room. Um, and, and again, you know, it's, it's kind of flexible. I did this, if you go to the overhead, Kara, uh, and what this allows me to do is it allows me to sort of, uh, I took off the power connector, uh, maybe the side view, uh, uh, maybe the, the side view, there you go. So I took off the power connector, which allows me to, uh, to do that. I soldered directly onto the board. Uh, it was just a little bit more permanent because I, what I didn't want is I didn't want the power coming into the board to accidentally get ripped out of that terminal and perhaps short out my power source. That, that, would, be, that would be no bueno. All right, let's go to the third thing. The third thing that we're going to need is a U-Back. Now, I personally, I love these little ready-to-fly quads 99-cent specials. I've used these quite a bit in my projects. Uh, they're nice and small, which is what I want inside of my enclosure, but they're also incredibly inexpensive. So when I, when I bought these, I bought like 50 of them. Uh, and actually, you know, Patrick, do you have a scissor? Let's, let's open this up. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to see yeah. through the Mylar bag. There you go. Rawr, rip it up. Size of a fingernail. So that's what it looks like. Nice and small. It's got an input side and an output side. Uh, and all you have to do is you have to change the voltage with that tiny little, that little uh, screw thing. You just you turn that and you can change the voltage that comes out. This can accept anything from 5 volts all the way up to 28 volts. Uh, and uh, the, the nice thing about this is when I use these, it means that I don't have to really worry about the voltage going in. As long as I could find a power adapter that gives me less than, say, 48 volts and more than 5, it's going to give me the right voltage for the project box. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's an easy way not to blow things up. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that you can look for is, I care if you show them the, uh, the uh, image there, these are very common on eBay. This is a 5-volt U-back 
This will take a very wide range. They are quite a bit bigger. So if you're going to be having one of these projects that is going to be using up all the interior space of the project box, this might not be for you. But the advantage to this is it provides much cleaner power. Uh, those, these ones are the kind of down and dirty. They work, uh, but I don't know about the long-term longevity. <laughs> So what's the cost difference between these two? Uh, it's, it's like $2. Oh. Uh, the larger ones cost $3. Okay. For me, it's not the cost, it's the size. Yeah. Well, I, I always wonder like something that's nice and small. Yeah, yeah it, it just fits better. It's going to generate a lo little less heat, and it means that I don't have to... Uh, you, you probably know this. That last step where you're shoving wires back into the project. <laughs> yeah. You're hoping that you insulated everything so that you don't get a short. You don't want to have to take it all out and put it in a bigger box <laughs> yeah. to just fit it in that one little box you already have. Precisely. So if you can make the components smaller and a little simpler, it ends up working a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we've got our we've got our um, our LEDs. We've got the strip driver. We've got our power. The next thing we're going to want are some of the controls that are going to go on to our little nano box. If you go to the overhead, you'll notice that I've got four potentiometers, and these are all 20 uh, 20k um, uh, potential. Uh, what do you call it? Re adjustable resistors. Uh, and then I've got two different types of buttons. I've got a momentary. So this is you press and it pops back up. This, as if you can hear it. It's the clicky type, so it's click on, click off. Um, I designed this box so that it could be used by multiple types. And in fact, we're going to show when we get to the 3D design, 3D design part of this episode, uh, I'll show you what I'm going to be giving you, what you'll be able to download, and then you make the box according to what you want to do. This has been set up for the more advanced version of our little Stargate control, because this is going to be red, blue, green, and then we're going to have the ability to turn it on and off this is going to switch between manual and automatic, and then this will allow me to change either the brightness or the frequency of the animation. I would have put a knife switch on there, but that's yeah. just me. <laughs> but that's the point. The point is you can change this top because oh, yeah. this yeah. top actually comes off, and I put in the controls that I want. And I'm going to yeah. show you some of the things I've done inside to make it a bit more modular because uh, you know it doesn't help to make the case modular if the electronics aren't modular. Right. All right. So we, we've, we're going to get the, uh, the controls that we want. If you go to that first link there, Kara, the potentiometers, these are the ones that I used. Nice and cheap. You can buy a 10-pack of these for about $5. Uh, I was actually thinking, Patrick, I, there are some of these pots that have really nice caps, like aluminum caps. I was thinking maybe a few of those, but I, I, I'm not sure. I, those are way more expensive. I can't justify the cost right now. But... If you're making a project for display, that yeah, you might want to think about that. But uh, it's modular. You can always switch it, it out. It's totally modular. Uh, speaking of the buttons, here are the buttons that I'm using. Uh, if you go to that next link, Kara, uh, the buttons are uh, they're they're standard 13 millimeters. So that's how large I've made the the hole inside of the panel. Uh, any button that does 13 millimeter, and there are so many in this format. Uh, again, you've got the momentary one. You've got the push on, push off. There are those that light up. You get to choose what you want. As long as it will fit the template, it will fit inside the control panel that we're, we're giving them. And looking cool is just a bonus. Looking cool. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's all going to look cool. Yeah. Duh. Especially if the buttons light up. Of course. And, of course, the last thing you're going to need is an Arduino Nano. We have a lot of these. I bought like a 50-pack of them. Um, that's that's the, uh, the size of Arduino that I've set up for use inside this tray. You could use larger and you could use smaller, but then you'll have to adjust the tray to fit your device. Yeah? Yeah. OK, cool. <laughs> All right, folks, what we're going to do in just a bit, I'm going to show you what goes into creating the 3D parts. Because unlike a lot of our other projects, I'm going to take you step by step on what I did to create the project box and then what you can do to customize it for whatever project you want to make. But before we do that, Let's go ahead and take a moment to thank a sponsor of this episode of Know How. You know, when you've got a great idea, it's one thing to have the project in mind. It's one thing to push it through, but you also need to think about placement. How are you going to get word of your project out to the world? How are you going to make sure that you get traffic at your site, that you get interest in your project? Well, folks, it's all about location, location, location. And on the internet, location means one thing. Hover. Hover is the place that you want to go when you're looking for a new domain, a new place to call your home. Now, Hover has over 400 domain extensions. They've got all the classics like .com and .net, plus niche extensions like .design and .tech. 
Once you find your domain, you can use the Hover Connect to set up your domain automatically with your website in just a few clicks. You can also use it to get more on-brand or professional email addresses than you might be using right now. This means that you don't have to try to create a professional persona while using a Gmail or a Yahoo account. It can be .you. And really, is there any better way to brand yourself? Uh, when all you want to do is buy a domain name or an email address, you shouldn't have to opt out of page after page of add-ons that you don't want, that you don't need, or that you might accidentally pay for. That's why Hover only offers domains and email so that you can focus on finding a great domain name and get back to working on your great idea or project. Unlike most other domain providers, Hover includes free Who is privacy with all supported domains to keep your information confidential. There's nothing quite like letting something slip and then finding a stalker who uses that to track you down. Don't, don't, don't do that. Instead, use Hover.com. Oh, if you already have multiple domains scattered across other domain providers, you can save money by consolidating them into Hover. With volume discounts, the more domains you have in your account, the more of a discount Hover will automatically apply to that account. With Hover, there's no more digging through help articles to figure out how to get your domain working. If you need a hand, you just give them a call, and Hover's awesome support team is there to help you. Folks, if you are looking for the best possible location on the internet, if you want to drive more traffic to your project, if you think your next great idea just needs a great place on the net, you owe it to yourself to try Hover. Find the perfect domain name for your idea. Go to Hover.com and use the promo code KNOWHOW at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase. That's Hover.com and use the promo code KNOWHOW. And we thank Hover for their support of KNOWHOW. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. We've got uh, this. This is something I printed up last night. It's actually all three components of the uh, project box. This actually already oh. kind of came off. Um, I do something a little fun with this, if you go to the overhead that I'm showing them right now. Uh, this has uh, a, the Dremel tape, but I, I always have problems making my print stick to that. So I just yeah. use a little bit of Elmer's glue uh, or, or a glue stick. I, I rub a nice thin layer on it. The nice thing about this is it, it adheres really, really well. I don't get the, the bacon anymore, but it also means that when I want to remove it, I just sort of drop this in a tub of warm water. All the glue dissolves, and it makes it so much easier to pull, pull this oh. off. This is, this is simple because it's not held on by much, but when you've got large surfaces like this, yeah. they tend to not want to come back off, uh, especially if you've used good adhesion. But for this, ta-da! Try it off. Yep. So I just, I've already gone ahead and weakened that glue layer, and let's see, it's fine if I got, there we go, dissolved edge. Oh, it's greasy. Oh, that's not grease, that's glue. Well... Yeah, I know, sorry. Glue's not usually yeah, slippery. Yeah, you, you, you do have to wash it a little bit uh, in order to get all the glue off, but this is probably my favorite way of doing 3D prints because that glue does wash off. It gets rid of all the residue, uh, but it, it guarantees that my print doesn't start to bow up, which I really, really don't like. Yeah. 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 All right, so these are the three component parts of Project Nano. This is the tray. So actually, you know, I better wipe this off before I put it on anything, otherwise it's going to get glue on, on everything. This is the tray that the Arduino is going to go into. In fact, it fits in like so, just like that. It's a perfect fit for this, and, uh, and actually, if you, uh, if you look here, this has been designed so that there's a cutout, so you'll be able to access the USB port even when it's inside the enclosure. Uh, which is nice. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to, to put this in here. I did design a version of the nano box that used little uh, risers so that they would go into the mounting holes. Those did not last. Those kept breaking off. Oh, they were too fragile. They're just too fragile. I mean, it's too thin for it to, to I mean, even just regular usage, they'll just snap off. Yeah. So what I ended up doing was I just put hot glue in the bottom and just stuck it down. <laughs> uh, these are so cheap. I mean, even if I toss the tray, that's okay. That's, that's fine. Uh, but I did install the pins. I did install the pins so that I can breadboard straight off of this Arduino Nano. Speaking of breadboarding, that was one of the other trays that I designed. I designed one that did have a breadboard at the bottom so that I could do some quick prototyping and still make it look nice. Uh, now, this has a couple of design features that uh, I do want to take a look at. If you go ahead and, and move over to my computer, um, there we go. This is what it looks like. Though the bottom part, the basic part, is comprised of that and these, these side walls, and then these columns. The columns are the, that's actually the, the column up and down on either side that's going to join the three segments together. So there's a screw, a, uh, three, a 3M screw that goes up through the bottom here, and as you can see, it's tapered 
so that that screw kind of gets sunk into the uh, the bottom surface of the box. And then if you look really closely, this. This means that the, the uh, column for the middle section actually comes right down in the middle here. So it kind of holds it together and holds it in alignment. And then there's just two little pieces, one on this side and one on this side, that keep the box from sliding back and forth. Uh, that's, that's really all you need in order to keep this, uh, the, the middle section on top of the tray. Now I can change this, and this file is going to be made available. Uh, I have the tray for the Nano in here, but you can, you can design your own tray. You can remove this. In fact, when, when, this, uh, when you download this, this is all going to be empty. There's going to be none of that inside. This is the only basic segments that you need. Then you get to design what goes inside. But since we're using an Arduino Nano, and since we're using the uh, RGB strip driver, we're going to stay with this. Uh, now, let me show you how this fits on. So I've got the top section, uh, the middle section right here. I've got the bottom section right here. I've keyed it so that it will only fit one side. If you try to put it backwards, it actually doesn't fit on really well. <laughs> See, it just goes like, oh, well, what are you doing? Ah. It just I, snaps into place. It just snaps into place. You've got a riser on each side that keeps this from going on. But if you'll notice here, take a look at that. Notice how it's, it's offset? Yeah. And that's by design, because I slightly offset it so that you couldn't install this the wrong way. I see. So if you try to put it together and you're like, wait a minute, how come this edge is sticking out? It's because you've got this reversed. And the only reason why I did that is I could, most of the time it doesn't matter, but you may have a project where you've actually like bonded something to the side. Yeah. And if that's the case, you don't want to install it backwards. So, but if I install it the right way, suddenly, there you go. So oh yeah, nice you and can't flush. even tell there's an edge there. Yep, that's, that's how that's supposed right to work. Uh, now the top, the top piece, if we go back over here to my uh, computer camera, the, the, uh, is actually the middle piece. You'll notice that the column continues, and that's the column that gets put down into that, uh, that bottom support so that it stays nice and uh, straight on the, uh, on the tray. Then I've got this. If you notice, the surfaces on the side, they're kind of beveled. Uh, and that's by design. What I wanted was I wanted a way for the control panel to be sunk into the, uh, the middle section and to be held in place so that it's not, you know, wobbling back and forth. Uh, I also did, I kind of wanted something to look cool. I'm, I'm done with, you know, making it just a box. So, yeah. <laughs> this is the simplest section, but the nice thing about this is I can grow or shrink this based oh, yeah. on how much space I need inside my project. So you can make it taller. Yeah, or if, I, if this is like a super simple project, I could cut this in half and have it low profile. Yeah. Uh, so again, it, what we wanted is we wanted modular. Uh, now here's a little, little, little fun thing. If you look at this entire project, actually I'm going to drop this layer down because this is the avoid box. You'll notice I originally made the entire project box as one piece. Um, and uh, actually, Kara, if you go back to the overhead, this is what the original looked like. So it's a, it's a, it's a black piece. It's just like the red piece. It's, it's got the, uh, it's got the uh, outlets there for power and for the USB. It's got my, uh, my tray design. But why wouldn't you want it? Uh, why do you want it as two pieces? Why not one piece? I would think that would be sturdier. Yeah, this is sturdier. This is far sturdier. But what I found was when I'm installing electronics, it is a pain in the butt, oh. especially like really small, trying to jump around on this. Now, if this was going to be for a one-time project, I'm going to install it, I'm, and I'm never going to tear the thing apart, I'm never going to troubleshoot it, this is actually better because this will right. give me a much longer-lasting product. But if I ever want to make changes, this was a pain because this box is not yeah. much space to work inside of. Maybe somebody with small hands could do it. Precisely. <laughs> but what this gives me is, you know, so if I see both of these side by side, uh, they are the exact same project box, but because I can remove this section, it's much easier to work on the electronics. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So again, what I, I would say is, if, if you're making a project box for permanent installation, uh, go ahead and, and go with this. And actually, I'm going to make this file available if you want to go this, this route. But if you want a little easier time working on it and maybe prototyping another project, this is the way to go. All right, so let's take a look at the control panel. The control panel is very simple. It, uh, because I've got that beveled edge, it just goes right inside. And then it's got, again, the, the sunk screw area so that when I do install this, the screws don't stick off the surface. That's, that's kind of what we wanted. In fact, here, let's look at the finished version. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of space, even more, from, from the top of the screw into the surface. So if I wanted to, I could put you know, just a little red something to, to, to cover those yeah. up. And you've screwed it to both the top and bottom. Right, right. So, so that, that column in the, in the middle, yeah. 
Yeah, it meets in the middle, so it, it holds on both sides. Uh, little, little secret here. If you go back to the, uh, the computer, Kara, a little secret. On the bottom, so this, the tray, I've made this. So th this is the void that gives me my screw hole. That's four millimeters wide. See, if I actually do this, you can see right there. That's four millimeters wide. But if I look at the middle section, which is the part that actually holds uh, that in there, if I, let's see if you can zoom in on that. That's three millimeters wide. And the reason for that is I want it to slide through the bottom and then get caught in the middle. Yeah. Uh, and three millimeters is the size of the screw. This is actually perfect. One thing, um, don't over tighten. Oh no. You, cause you strip, you strip really fast. Yeah, it's uh, just plastic. It is just so. plastic. You can fix it. What I found is a little bit of crazy glue, kind of like free <laughs> kajiggers a little bit, but just, just don't strip it. Or a bigger screw. A bigger <laughs> screw. Luckily, the part that's gonna be stripped is the easiest, easiest to replace. I, again, oh, this yeah. is how I designed it, so that the bottom section doesn't have any part to strip, neither does the panel. Only this middle section, which is relatively hollow, has the area that, that uh, will get destroyed. So if you do strip your project, you just reprint another one of these and you're good to go. Yeah, it's right. simple. Now, the heart of the project is actually going to be the top. And if you go back to my computer, this is what it looks like. This is the basics. These are the pieces you need. Actually, you don't even need this. I just put that in there because I like ridges. <laughs> ridges are better. Uh, notice how I've got, it's the classic piece on a piece. So this is actually the top. Um, the, so the part that's going to touch the printing surface, which is going to end up looking ugly, uh, that's going to be screwed down into the box. I, I did this. Th there's no reason for this. You could make this the same size. I just kind of like the, the little step look. It, I, I want it at a little bit of depth <laughs> to the project. It's, you know, it's a thing. Uh, but as long as you make it this size, this, this uh, shape here, which is 60 by 80, as long as it's 60 by 80, it will fit perfectly into that middle section, into the project box. Now, the, you might be asking yourself, well, what do I do with this? Well, here's the fun part. We're going to be making a bunch of templates for the different controls that we want. In fact, uh, now that you've mentioned it, I'm going to make a template for that, the Frankenstein switch, the little uh, electric Oh, the nice switch. The nice switch yeah. thing. I love those. <laughs> but uh, so I'm going to browse. I've got two that are available for you right now. Um, it's good. They're going to be inside the file that you download. They are helper files. So if you go to the nano box, you're going to find a little folder called helper files. And inside the helper files, you'll have a template for a button. That's the 13 millimeter button that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And a template for the potentiometer uh, for the pot. So let's start with the pot. If you open this up and then you import it, it looks like this. Come on. It's coming. There we go. All right. So just like with the aqua vase, we need to turn this into a void, which is really simple. We use the inspector. Now it's a hole. This is where your potentiometer is going to go. So right. th this is the perfect size. In fact, let's, let's take a look at what the potentiometer looks like here. Um, if you go to the side view, you can get, there we go. Uh, so it's not just this. This is the six millimeter hole that the shaft needs to fit through in order for it to fit properly. Right. But you've also got this, this little overhang. Oh, yeah. What that does is it, it, it makes it, it gives it purchase so that when you're turning the knob, the, it doesn't. The, turn the whole assembly. Precisely. It, what will happen, yeah. I remember I had the old ones that didn't have that, and what happened, if you didn't tighten it right, or if it vibrated loose, you, you would start getting less responsiveness, and you'd actually start doing this, and if you did it enough, and right. this were to say contact the body of the potentiometer next to it, it would short out. Yeah, and if you spin it enough, you'll pull the wires off. Precisely. That's, that's not good. It's trouble. Whereas, when I use this, see, this has the, uh, all those template holes, and I put it through, Oh, yeah, actually, you know what? Um, maybe I should take the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd done that. That's my bad. Take that off. This just goes in like this, and that's not going anywhere. Once I tighten that down, because of that additional hole, it's going to stay in the same orientation all the time. And when I end up putting the, the cap, the knob, onto this thing, you won't see that hole. Yeah, I had no idea the holes were there in the, on the yeah, yeah. demo model thing. But if you go back to my computer, I have designed this with four potentiometers and two buttons. You can design it any way you want. Just know that the larger one is for the shaft and the smaller one is for the holder. And that means you have to know the orientation of your potentiometer. Because in this particular case, I know that the, the, uh, the holding stand is here and the shaft is there. So. Uh, if you go back to the computer, Kara, 
If I have it this way, the tines are going to be towards the bottom, towards the middle. If I flip it around like so, the tines are now towards the top. Uh, and it all, it's all depends on your, your particular design, right? And yeah. I can switch it any way I want, any degree, uh, any which way I want the potentiometer to go. Just know that you're going to need about five to six millimeters for the times. Uh, so I, I like kind of angle them away from everything. Yeah, you don't want those going right into the edge. Yeah. Uh, the other item that we've included is the template for the buttons. This will work for any 13 millimeter button. I didn't really need to include this template because it's just a 13 millimeter hole. Uh, but I just thought, you know, if people want to play, this is what you got. And then you can just add these wherever you need them. So because this is modular, you can design the control panel to include as many buttons, as many potentiometers, and as we add templates, any other components that you want to be accessible after the project box is closed. Like right now, I've just made a monster of a project. That's <laughs> yeah. They're not just even alive. horrifically oh. ugly. It's, it's terrible. Uh, but again, you know, we want people to be able to customize this to work the way that they want it to work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, next up, Patrick, you know what I want to do? What? I want to start integrating all this stuff. Yeah, sounds good. Let's yeah. get this together. Let's get it together. Let's show them how we're going to be uh, adding a few of our components, how we're going to solder a few of these things together, and how everything ends up going inside of our project box. Yeah. What we have is I've, I've taken apart the project box that, uh, that we showed earlier on the episode. This is what my control panel looks like. Now, you'll notice I've got the four potentiometers. I've got the two buttons. The buttons are not actually connected to anything yet, but these are ready to go. I have taken a uh, Wakara connector, and uh, I've decided that I'm going to stop using nothing but JSTs. Uh, I've, I've been a very big fan of these because they're easy to get. They're super, super cheap. The problem is I've got some that can only take 5 volts and some that can take multiple, like 12 and above. And you've lost track, which is which? Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, I mean, I haven't lost track yet, but I'm afraid at some point I'm going to yeah, make gonna a cross-connection. It's going to happen. Yeah. So for me, anything that's 12 and above is going to be with a JST. Anything that's like 3.7 to 5 volts is going to use one of these walk carriers. And this is easy yeah. because this is the same connector that we use on the uh, the SEMA quadcopters, yeah. which means our little LiPo batteries that we use for this, th those will work for any of these projects. Oh, wow. Yeah. In fact, that's what I used for the when I, we did the steampunk goggles. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Made it really, really simple. But the reason why I did this, if you look at the wiring here, uh, if you stay on the side shot, if you look at the wiring, this is, it's going to be its own circuit. I, uh, I made the mistake once of wiring my potentiometers in series, so I went like, uh, ground, voltage, ground, voltage, ground, voltage, oh. just across. Uh, and it worked, but the problem is when you change voltage on one potentiometer, you will actually affect the voltages on the others. Yeah. It's not supposed to, because you're only supposed to get a change on the wiper, but it does. Um, and that was causing some very strange... <laughs> out yeah, don't, don't do that. So yeah. these are all wired in parallel to this. And now this is going to be fed by this. This is that little uh, UBEC, the ready-to-fly quads UBEC. This has been potted down to 12 uh, to 5 volts. So I've got 12 or above on this side, and then on this side I've got 5 volts. You'll notice there's a couple of split-offs here, though, because I wanted the raw voltage also to go to the strip driver, because that's going to drive the, the LEDs. Right. Uh, and then on this side I've got this, and these are the 5 volt leads that are going to go to my Arduino. So this is going to power my Arduino. This is going to power the potentiometers. This is where power comes in. And this is where power goes to the 12 volt LEDs. So if I, as long as I give this 12 volts in, it gives, me an, it gives me the two different voltages I need to run this project, 12 volts and 5 volts. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've used these, these a lot. So I didn't want to do the soldering again. But quite simply, I've got voltage coming in and voltage going out. Yeah, all right. So next part that we want to show is we want to show how these potentiometers are actually installed. Uh, I've got a, uh, a one right here. And let's go ahead and heat up our little, uh, there we go. If uh, you go back to the wide shot, it's going to take a while, uh, Kara. There we go. So it's going to take a while to heat up our, our little soldering iron. I, I love this thing, by the way. Um, remember with potentiometers, the important part is I've got three pins. I've got voltage pins, and it could be either way, ground or voltage, voltage, voltage and ground. You just, as long as you've got about five volts going through this, mm -hmm. it's fine. That middle pin is what's called the wiper. As I move the potentiometer, so as I, as I move the knob, what's going to happen is I'm going to get varying voltage on that from zero all the way up to the maximum voltage that's passing through the potentiometer. 
Right. Right. So yeah. from no voltage all the way up to, in this case, uh, five volts that pass through. That is going to go into my Arduino, and the Arduino will be able to use that to figure out what yeah. value I want. It can interpret the data and Precisely. do Precisely. whatever with it. The first thing we're going to do is we need to tin this. This is something that we've done before. Um, if you tin, it always makes your projects a lot easier. Because if you don't oh, tin, yeah. what's going to end up happening is uh, you'll find it, like things don't stick. You end up doing weird things yeah. and just have globs and globs of solder. Not so great. So if you go to the, the close-up view here, uh, really simply, I'm going to have to do this at an You're not going to melt the plastic, are you? Uh, no, I'm not going to be contacting it long okay. enough. So I, I like to put a little bit of solder onto the iron, which allows me to transfer heat much more quickly to the surface. And then once that surface hits... Oh, hits the right temperature, this particular case about 350 degrees, the solder should just start to flow. There we go. See? And I'm, I'm putting some on the pin as well as on that middle piece. This is going to make it a lot easier when I, uh, I want to put in the, uh, the actual wires that are going to go here. So again, transfer heat, and then, there we go. And the last one. Uh, quick warning, don't put too much because what will happen is, oh, oh, and when I say what will happen, I mean what I have done in the past is I've put so much solder that the, it actually bridged contacts inside oh, the Oh, between the two. Yeah, don't yeah. do it. That's, that's, don't, don't, don't. I've done that too. Yeah, that's, that's not smart. All right, so I've got 30 gauge silicone wire. And again, I love silicone wire because it doesn't chafe because it can withstand really high temperatures and also just because it looks better. It doesn't <laughs> tangle up as, as easily. Uh, I'm going to connect a positive and a negative, and then I'm going to use this. This right here, this is the wire that I'm going to use so I can connect this to my Arduino. This is just a jumper cable that's been cut, um, and I've got uh, the female connector on this end. Right. Okay. Uh, before I solder this, what I want to do is I want to add a little bit of, of heat shrink tubing so that I can insulate this because I don't want any of these things to touch anything else. And remember, once it's inside the project box, you're going to be kind of yeah, damming it's stuff. Yeah, mashed together. Yeah, and it's a, what'll touch that's what. a really good recipe for blowing stuff up. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of red. I'm going to take a little bit of black and a little bit of white. So there we go. And these will be our pieces of heat shrink tubing that we're going to use to insulate our potentiometer. All right, so, uh, and I remember, whenever you're dealing with a connector that's like this, where the heat shrink won't fit over the, the far end, you always have to add the heat shrink before you solder. Yeah. And I say this because I actually did that last night. I completed the entire project, and then I was like, oh! You have to pull it apart to get I had that to pull it apart. Luckily, super easy, but still a, a pain. So let's go ahead and show you how we do this. This, the center one, that's the wiper pin, it's going to get this, this purple connector. Uh, so I'm just going to apply this, and I'm going to remelt that solder. There we go. So I'm going to wait until the solder on the pin reflows. And once it's solid, that's my connection, and that's actually quite tight. I'm going to do the same thing for positive and a negative. And again, doesn't matter what side's positive, what mm -hmm. side's negative, just stay consistent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same uh, model that I used here. In this particular case, I've got my, uh, my ground to the left side as the pins are looking down. So I'm going to put my ground here. Thanks, sure. Joel. Uh, I don't want to get in the way here. Actually, here, Patrick, can you hold that? Yeah. Yeah, get that in there. So, I, yeah, just, uh, it's got to be completely flat. Yeah, there we go. And reflow. Okay, and let's stay. There you go. So that's my ground, and then let's do my positive. Actually, I got this one. Okay. It's on my side. And like so. I actually do like when it reflows. It just sinks right in. It kind of sinks. It's like, yes. There you go. So I've now got my three connectors. Wipe that off. And what, I what I'll be able to do, once this cools down a little bit, I'll be able to run my insulators and then heat shrink them. 
and once they're heat shrinked, they'll look more like that. Um, and yes, you've got exposed connections here, but the important part are those tines. You don't want the tines sticking out because that's the part that will contact things like the metal housing. Yeah, those connectors aren't going to move, so they're not going to touch anything else. Precisely, precisely. Okay, so now that I've got, I've got, I, I would just repeat this. For as many potentiometers as I want to do, that's what I'm going to, that's exactly the way I'm going to do it. These will all be tied together as we did with the, uh, the uh, part I just showed you so that I'm connecting power to them in parallel. Remember, don't go positive, negative, positive, negative. <laughs> because then you'll tie the voltages of each potentiometer to the other voltages, which right. will change the values, which is a- Weird things happen. Weird things happen. We don't want to do that. Yeah. All right, so now I've got this. I've got my Arduino and I've got my bottom tray and I want this to stay in here. Again, I, I could go the route of making myself little cutouts uh, and so that I could hold this down. And I actually toyed with the idea of adding like an assembly that can be screwed down. But in the end, I decided that's all just way too much work. I just did this. Just fill the bottom cool. here with about a hunch of hot glue. Yeah. Pool of hot glue. Pool of hot glue. And then, ta-da. Oh, no, it's leaking out the end. Oh, oh, that's OK. Well, you don't want it to block the USB. Ta-da. Might have been a little too much hot glue. I, probably, <laughs> probably a bit too much. But judicious use of hot glue. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about this is it's going to it's going to keep the lines of the project. Um, it's not going to add that much weight. And again, these are so so cheap. I have so many of them that uh, you know if I have to keep this in there, I can. If I wanted to, you can actually pry this out. Hot glue is not that yeah, sticky. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's not a huge loss. And then I did the same thing for the strip driver. I just used a little bit of hot glue inside that tray and it stuck the strip driver into it. And so I get, yeah, I get that. Yay. So we're going to switch over to this so we can finish assembling the project. Uh, I need to install this piece. Again, this is our little voltage regulator. To remind you, voltage in on this side, it splits off. The original voltage splits off so I can give the full voltage to my LED strip driver. I've got five volts on this end. Five volts go to the Arduino, and five volts go to my potentiometers. All right, so if you look here, if I find my little teeny tiny screwdriver, and actually, could you unplug that hot glue gun? Yeah, it's, it's underneath. It oh, actually, wait, it's right here. I got it on your side. That's on my side. <laughs> uh, I need to put power in here. So this is, actually, go to the overhead. There you go. So right here, it's labeled, this is my ground connector, and the one uh, closest to the middle, that's my 12 volts. So I'm going to take my 12 volt line first, I'll open this up. And this, because I've pretend it, and if you don't pretend it, it will just it will tend not to go in the way you want. I'm just gonna slide this in. Actually, you know what makes it a little easier when you use pliers. I don't have my pliers with me, so I'm gonna be really gentle with my dikes. Ta-da! Get it in there. There you go. Same thing for the ground like so and if you wanted to be uber paranoid you could put a dollop of hot glue and it would make sure that these wouldn't accidentally vibrate free um, I will probably end up doing that when this gets more to like I'm done with the prototyping yeah but for now I, I do like to keep my options open now this is my 5 volt mm -hmm. line so I'm gonna I've got voltage pins on the Arduino Again, it's silk screen. Uh, if you, as long as you don't buy a super, super cheap one, you'll see one that says GND and one that says VIN. That's ground and voltage in. So the black is going to be my ground, which just goes like that. And VIN is my VIN, voltage in, which goes like that. And there we go. Now I've got a way to power the Arduino off of the same power supply that's also driving the 12 volts for the driver and five volts for my uh, potentiometer. Speaking of the potentiometers, let's do this. So I've got this on my Wakara connector. Boom. Now that's all of these potentiometers have power. But I need to connect the wipers of these potentiometers to the analog ins right. on, on this Arduino. So all of these? All of these. These are the individual wiper leads that I've connected. Uh, and uh, no particular order, I just went one, two, three, four. That, so one, two, three, and four. So the first one is going to be my blue one. And I'm going to collect blue to A0 or A1. 
I'm going to connect the second one, which is orange, to A2. The third one, which is green, goes to A3. And the last one, which is yellow, goes to A4. Now, typically, if I was going to do this in an actual prototyping environment, I would put these wires through the midsection because I want to close oh. it up. I'm not going to close this up right now. I'm, I, just, I just want to power this on. I've already got the code loaded up, and it's just going to run through a very simple loop, just like we have with our little Stargate here, uh, to, to, ro to drive my string of 5050 RGB LEDs. I created a little four pin connector here so I can quick connect this thing. It's a lot easier than the one that the one that they had, it tended to like just pull loose if you yanked on it, which oh, yeah, yeah I that. didn't really want that. Uh, if I've done everything right, I should plug this in, the Arduino should boot up, and it should automatically start delivering voltage to this and it should start going through its animation pattern. If I did it wrong, we're gonna get a very entertaining puff of blue smoke. <laughs> Let's find out. Ta da! And boom, Yay, there you go. Lights. Now, Patrick, there's going to be the experts in our audience who are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not doing anything with those potentiometers. You're not doing anything with those buttons. Right. And you're right, we're actually not. And the reason why we're not is because in the next episode, Patrick, who is our resident code warrior, is going to help us to design a few things to use those analog and digital inputs. Yeah, let's uh, get these turning. Let's get them turning. Now, folks, if you want any of the information that we gave you today, and that's going to include the files that you can download so you can make your own nano box. It's going to include the parts list for everything from the SMD LEDs to the, uh, to the LED strip driver to the Arduino. That's all going to be found on our show notes. All you need to do is go to twit.tv slash kh. And as long as you're there, why not subscribe? Automatically get two episodes of Know How into your device of choice every single week. Just click that little button to the side. You can get the audio version in your iPod. You can get video versions on your tablet, your desktop, your laptop, wherever you may want it. Yeah. That's also not the only place that you're going to find us. If you want to get us on Google+, Plus, which is the best place to find us, you're going to be there with over 10,000 Kitas. Those are the know-it-alls. Just go to Google Plus and look for Know How and subscribe. There's a little bit of an application process. You have to say you want to join. We have to approve you, but we approve everybody. It's just a thing to keep, keep up, up the spam. The spammers. The spammers, yeah. yeah. Don't forget that if you don't want to be on Google Plus, you can also find us on Twitter. You're going to find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. Patrick, where are you? I'm at twitter.com slash P Delahanty. And uh, you're going to find the third member of our crew who today is Kara Cole. Kara, where can people find you on the Twitters? I don't have a camera today, so, but you can find me on Twitter at Kara080. There you go. Until next time, I am Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Patrick Delahanty. And now that you know how, so do it. Yeah.